Uh, we're going to do the last uh, message on kingdom life. You know, it's been a great series. The next one's going to be good. But this, I really like this because this is the life that we're called to. When we have life in Christ, we have life in the kingdom. And it's, and it's a wild life, man. I mean, this is, a, this is a great life. But we want to make sure that we define accurately what we're talking about. Because a lot of words in Christendom get thrown around. We live under the assumption we know them. You know, we, you know, we use the word love a lot. But when does anybody actually dial it in and say, this is actually what love is? This is what it isn't? Biblically, what is love? We throw the word fellowship around. We fellow, throw the, the word community around. We throw around a lot of different words. And we just kind of assume everybody knows what we're talking about. And kingdom is another one of those words that's mentioned 119 times in the New Testament and 89 times in the gospel. And if it's mentioned that many times in that short amount of space, then it would behoove us to really kind of pay attention to what it really means and, and, and what that life in that realm looks like. And so I've simplified it because I like simple. And here's the simple definition of the kingdom of God. It's the rule of reign of God in effect. It's the rule and reign of God that's in effect. You see, if we, if we come to church and there's no prayers, there's no word, there's a, you know, a couple anemic, unanointed songs... Uh, you know, and we all go home and we have a cup of coffee on the way out. I doubt there was an encounter with the rule and the realm of God. And that's the rule and realm that he's invited us into. It's what, once again, very simply, and I think we overcomplicate it. And you can read a lot of books on, on, on the kingdom, you know, that you can get really lost in it. But, you know, I, I like this simple, practical, you know, definition. It, it really means... What God wants done now. It's what God wants done. So that makes it very simple for you and me as Christ followers. We simply live our life. We go through our life. And wherever we go, we have this prayer in the back of our hearts and minds that simply goes like this. God, what do you want done here? That's all you have to ask. You only have to ask, God, what do you want right now? What is your kingdom rule and reign want right now? And how do I participate with your will in this moment right here? You don't have to figure the whole thing out. You just have to ask simple, simple question. What do you want done? What's his will? When you know the word, you know his will. So, you know, we took, uh, let's see, two weeks ago, uh, with Easter, you know, we're building a big house in Haiti for 24 displaced kids. Let me ask you a question. Do you think it's God's will that 24 displaced teenagers that have nowhere to live and sleep should have shelter? Yes or no? Yes. Is, is it a, well, let, let's pray a little more about that. Do you really need to pray a little more about that? What if that was your son or daughter? Suddenly we don't, suddenly we don't have to pray all that much, do we? And so they said, we need, we need a big house, 1,350 square feet, that can house 24 young people, and we're going to put a, a, a toilet and a shower in each one of them, which may not sound like a big deal to you, but I've been in enough houses down there that don't have that, uh, so it's a big deal, <clears throat> almost a luxury item, if you will. And so Pastor Brandon graciously said, you know what, we'll give you know, the first 10000 of our offering to go towards that. It's a total of 15000 uh, and then nonprofit, the other 5000 and here's a picture of the progress so far, we leave next Friday. There's part of the foundation going up already. They're working hard. There's the walls that go up. And so I leave Friday. I'll be there Saturday. I'll be preaching in the church on Sunday. And I will give you a live update, by the grace of God, next week. So what does God want done? So you and I just kind of like hobble around the world asking that question. What does God want done in this country, in that country, in this community, in this neighborhood, in this city, in this home? In, 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 in my surrounding neighbors, God, what do you want done? That's the kingdom. And then we let him do what he so easily does. And I mean, that's, that's, that's the kingdom life. I'll, I'll give you a graphic example of what this looks like. Because when the kingdom comes, there's a displacement that takes place. Remember when it says over in Mark, he, he says, repent for the kingdom of God has come. Listen, two kingdoms can't coexist. Two kingdoms, the kingdom of light and darkness, can't coexist in you. One's got to go. When Jesus came into your life, he displaced 
your selfish little kingdom. My hedonistic little kingdom got ruined and wrecked for the rest of my life. I actually had to love people. <laughs> crazy, crazy life. Right? There's a displacement that takes place. I was in Brazil and uh, did a five or six week intensive class down there uh, at a seminary. And it was in this really kind of nice motel hotel with a couple of pools. And I mean, it, it was done really nice. And so I was talking to the director of the seminary. I said, hey, what's the story behind this place? He goes, this is a great story. He goes, this place used to produce pornography. This was a place where they did all that bad stuff. And two of our pastors had a vision that we should go and buy, that they should go and buy that place and make a missionary sending center out of it. So they prayed, their staff prayed, their people prayed, and they kept praying and praying and praying. And then they felt, now's the time to go. So they went, and they went to the place, and they went in, and they talked to the guy, and they said, we're here to make an offer. We want to buy this place. The owner, with a mortified look on his face, says, I know. God visited me in a dream and told me to sell it to you. Simple question. Does God want a porno factory there or a seminary that sends missionaries? You tell me. You don't even need a lot of discernment on that one. That's what I'm talking about. The kingdom of God displaces other kingdoms, which means that you and I have to go to places that we don't necessarily want to go. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is not limited by God. It's limited by the church. It's limited by the fear and myopia of the church. So that's kind of what this message is all about. That's what it's all about. <laughs> Three things Jesus uses to make disciples. Okay, this is just a little intro stuff right here. And you'll love these three things. <laughs> you got to embrace these three things. Pressure. Power and presence. Pressure, power, and presence. Get used to these three things. Uh, this is what a disciple lives with. This is what a Christ follower lives with. That the, there is no getting around these three things if you're a disciple. There's no shortcut. There's no loopholes out of this. I mean, I've looked. I've tried. I want an easier route. I like shortcuts. I really do. I want to just go read a couple of books. Call me a disciple. I want to go to a seminar. I want to get the lanyard with my name on it. I want to get the free treat bag. And call me a disciple. It's kind of not what he's using, though. Jesus is using pressure. Now, don't you just love pressure? Pressure and stress. In intensity. Me neither. But that's what he's using. A.W. Tozer says, God never uses anyone greatly until he tests him deeply. There's no getting around it. Pressure. It's intense stuff. A friend of mine is in a country I can't name, ministering to a group of people I can't mention. But at one point, a woman that him and his wife had been ministering to and sharing the gospel with over a period of time, her brother came to my friend and looked him in the eye and said, I just want you to know, if my sister converts to Christianity, it is my duty as the older brother to kill her. I just want you to know that. Think about that for a moment. That's pressure. Do you cave in? Do you run the risk of she walks in Jesus? Jesus comes to her. She becomes a Christ follower. And she dies. And you know it was because of your words. That's pressure. I don't want to. Did I sign up for that? We did. But that's just a graphic illustration. And granted, you may not... Yet that may not face you. You may not experience that kind of pressure, but we're not getting out of pressure. Now, fortunately, the grace of God is equal to the pressure that we endure. And if it's not, none of us have a chance anyways. But pressure, that's, 
That's what he's using. Number two, a lot of people like this one, power. I like power. You like power? I don't like power just for power's sake, but I like power. I mean, when I was a young guy, I had a muscle car. Do you even know what that is? Those were cars like in the 60s that had big engines, big carburetors, sucked a lot of gas, but went really, really fast. And you could just step on the gas pedal and the tires and the back end would just go out of control. It was power. There's a power that you and I have with kingdom life, for kingdom life. It's not something that we seek. We don't seek the power. We seek Jesus, and the power comes with it to do the works of his kingdom. The apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it, not me, it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes this, first to the Jew, then to the Greek. The power. He would say in 1 Corinthians, you know, in the midst of a real dysfunctional church, he said, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom or eloquence, but no, it was in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. I don't think you and I can live a kingdom life without the power of God. I just don't. So power. Now, once again, you think, where, where, where cometh this power from? Glad you asked in King James. <laughs> Came from Jesus. I want you to just listen to a couple of verses that Jesus said that just, bam. Jesus said in Luke 22, verse 29, he said, I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred upon me. Notice that. What does he say when he's talking about, I confer. I appoint the kingdom to you. I assign the kingdom to you. To you, it has covenantal language, which means that there is a, a unity and a union and a communion and a divine participation with God Almighty in the realm and through the realm of that kingdom. That's a big deal, man. We're not, you know, we, we have blown just going to church on Sunday a few exits ago. This is, I confer on you a kingdom. And remember what, remember what Jesus told? Listen to what he said. Brandon got it. Uh, <laughs> Listen to what, 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 what did Jesus say? He said, seek the kingdom. And then he said, don't fear, little flock. For it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We're not talking about keys to the car, folks. We're talking about keys to the kingdom. That's a big deal. With all the resources and responsibilities and relationship that goes with that. Now, once again, I want you to note how freely it's given. That's the big deal. He freely gave that. The Father freely gives the kingdom. He didn't say, you have to reach a certain spiritual plateau mature-wise. You have to know so many verses. You have to know so many books of the Bible. You've got to know eschatology, Christolo Christology, soteriology, pneumatology. You've got to know these things. Pass a few tests. Then we'll get you in the Kingdom 101 class. And then Kingdom 202. No, 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 no. He's looking at a bunch of people that have a tendency to be a little afraid. And he says, seek the kingdom. And then he says, don't be afraid, for it is the Father's good pleasure. Are you telling me God Almighty likes to dole out kingdom life to the church? Exactly. And not reluctantly. Gives it freely. Once again, don't have time to go on it, but do you know some of you good Bible memory people, there's that freely given phrase that appears several times in the New Testament. Um, we're out of time. What did you say? Okay, uh, Sermon on the Mount, Beatitudes. Uh... Son asks for da, 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 the Father freely gives good gifts to those who ask Him. And He talked about freely giving the Holy Spirit to those that ask Him. And then in Romans chapter 5, it says, You have been freely justified by faith in Christ Jesus. Your justification, right standing before God, it came with zero merit on you. 
but all the benevolence of God towards you. It's a different deal here. This is, this is what lights me up. What we're talking about right here, this is what just kind of gets me really excited. I, I'm serious. I mean, power. We get power. This, once again, oh, I hesitate when I share stuff because I don't want you to think I think I'm anything because I am nothing. Christ in me is the hope of glory. I got nothing in and of myself. We got that. We got that. But Christ in me, okay? I'm in Pakistan, and they bring this little two-year-old up, and they said, this little child, maybe three, two or three, they said, he got attacked with a spirit of fear, and ever since, and, I, and it's been months, uh, and ever since, he has seizures, and, and he breaks out in sweats, just sweating. And there he was, man, just distressed, a, a distressed kid. I said, wow, what's the question to ask here? What does God want done? Remember? What is God? Does God want a two- or three-year-old kid bound by seizures, bound by fear, bound in sweat? Now, if you can tell me on some level that's God's will, great. But you can't because I know him. And I know the word. And that's not Jesus. So I just simply just, there's people all over the place thronging, man. I just put my hand on them in the name of Jesus. Father, take this away right now. And the kid went from agitated and restless to... Peace, calm. And the lady said in, in Urdu, thank you. <laughs> Walked away. It's like, awesome. It's not me. I'm just a dude. Just a big white dude over there. Just, just a dude who happens to love Jesus, who's willing to go some places that are maybe a little more difficult and ask God, what does he want done there? Now, I can't think of anything better. Honestly, I can't think of anything better. Uh, I don't have time to get into that. One writer, missiological writer, said back in 1971, uh, he, wrote, he wrote this book, and he said in the, in the South Asians, Polynesian cultures, that if when you show up to preach, there isn't some form of power encounter, they won't listen. They won't believe. In other words, the gospel you preach better have power behind it. When that happens, and it does happen, and it did happen a lot, he said, when that does, they desecrate their deities. They take their idols, they kick them to the curb, they follow Jesus wholeheartedly, they get baptized, they become disciples, and that's how it's done. See, the tendency is to just look at face value at some of the problems that are going on around the planet. You've heard of what's going on in Venezuela, right? You know, chaos, political upheaval, all kinds of anarchy, looting, the whole nine yards. It's easy just to look at a headline and go, man, that's just horrible what's going on down there. But you got to remember, the kingdom of God is always present somewhere. In these places, let me show you this picture. That's Venezuela. That's over 200 people getting baptized as the city's going through chaos. I just let that sink in. Because I've seen all the pictures and the video and the clips of, of just devastation, fires, looting, crazy, crazy, military coming in to, to keep order. But I'm telling you, all the while, the kingdom of God is at work over here, inviting people away from the chaos and into the Prince of Peace, Jesus. That's what's going on right there. That's so exciting. Here's the deal. A church that doesn't have power will resort to gimmicks. A drug addict doesn't need a free coffee cup from the church. He needs deliverance. A marriage that's on the rocks doesn't need a free latte. It needs the power of God. A person that's wrestling with mental illness doesn't need free lollipops. Need freedom. Need deliverance. I'm telling you. Oh, I just want to be really careful here. But I, I've had friends years ago, man, and they bring out the snow machine at Christmas. 
Okay, now, I like snow. <laughs> I like real snow. <laughs> and he was telling me, yeah, man, we'll bring out this snow machine. We have all this stuff for Christmas and all that. And I said, remember when you just needed a Bible? There's a, okay, I confess, there is a Pharisee at times that lives in here. I get it. I'm just, I'm telling you. I, no, don't say, do you think, yeah, I am. I get it sometimes. A friend of mine built this massive, massive church, massive, and he gave me a tour through it, <laughs> and he took me in this room that was as big as this stage with wall to wall, ceiling, floor to ceiling, electronic gadget, I mean, the whole thing, just, I don't even know what was in there. He goes, look at this. And I said, remember when you just needed a Bible? He goes, stop. I said, okay. You want power? You want gimmicks? You want little treats? You want some free stuff? You want a giveaway? You wonder why people don't take Christians serious? We're gimmicky. Just gimmicky at times. Give me the power. Give me death. Seriously. The world it doesn't need these little things. You know what it doesn't need? We think the world needs relevance. We need to make Jesus relevant. That's the last thing they need. They need Jesus and all his resplendent glory and all his resplendent compassion. They need Jesus as he is, not a dressed up, palatable Jesus that will make feel kind of, oh, okay, it's kind of good, but oh yeah, there's a cross in the back room that we'll tell you about later when you come to him. No, oh, give him the whole thing. Well, what's it going to cost me? Oh, nothing. You get everything. You just get everything, you know. But yeah, there's a few sacrifices later. No, there, there's one whole sacrifice. Jesus sacrificed all for you, and you sacrificed all for him. And we suffer graciously. And we don't need tricks. We don't need spiritual Houdinis. And we don't need polished professional speakers. We need raw people that know God, that know the word, that tell it like it is, and then have power to back it up by love. Because if there's no love, it's just a bad attitude with a few scriptures on it. I need a cup of coffee. No, it wasn't free. My wife paid for it. <clears throat> Here's the third thing, presence. Glad you're laughing. You'll be crying in about four minutes. No, I'm kidding. The third thing we need that, that Jesus does to make disciples is his presence. The presence of God is not reserved for worship services. Okay? Once again, the thinking is a lot that churches gather people, we do worship, and we do, you know, just singing and we get exuberant and everything, and then the presence of God is there, which I agree. I contend for that. I believe the presence of God is here right now. If not, I'm just a dude talking. Uh-huh. We don't want that. We don't want just me talking. Trust me. The presence of God was here and is here. And will be here as long as anybody's here. But that doesn't say the kingdom of God. It didn't say. And when you go to church, the kingdom of God is present. 90% of all miracles in the Gospels took place away from the synagogue. The kingdom is out there, in here, and in here, and is not bound by the laws of other countries, religious rules, regulations. It's not bound by any of that. Now, we may think we're bound. You can't bind the kingdom of God. It's not boundable. Is that a word? Boundable? Bombable? Bindable? It can only be restricted by people that don't have the faith to enter into it and move with it. Presence, the essence of the gospel. This is it. Once again, simplify, simplify, simplify. The essence of the gospel is that Jesus is actively restoring all things to himself real time. 
I love praying for future revivals and stuff, but you know, I am more preoccupied because I believe that Jesus is present tense. Is he a historical figure? Absolutely. Is he future? Absolutely. But is he real time? Absolutely. And that's the thinking that we got to get. That, that whole God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. So it's like wherever he went. And we've got to get the mindset wherever we go, I'm available. I believe, and I know because I was a pagan. I was a heathen dude, man. I'm, I mean, bad, bad guy. I could somehow intuitively, I knew who was saved. I knew who were, the Christians were. I really did. It was a weird, I can't explain it to you. It was a bizarre thing. I mean, in all my hidden, crazy, I'd see somebody, and I, and I just kind of watch them from afar, and then sometimes I'd go up to them. Hey, are you, are you like a Christian? Almost every time. Yeah. Without even them saying a word. Because there's something about the darkness in the lost that gravitates towards light. There is something different about you. There is something different about me. And it's not just because you got a haircut and you smile a little more or that you're a little nicer. No, 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 no. It transcends all that. I believe the, the Spirit of God in us expresses Himself without us even knowing it. That's why you ever have people come up to you and start engaging in a conversation. They say, I don't even know why I'm telling you all this. You ever have any? How many of you ever had that? Just out of the blue. Somebody, lift up your hands. Why, why did they do that? Because there's something in you that drew that out of them. And we should expect that. It happens all the time. It's absolutely crazy. I'm in Pakistan. My guy is late every single day. Every single day. He apologizes every single day. I tell him, no worries. No problem. He's watching. I see. Um, every day. Because I don't care. You know why? Because I got a phone. <laughs> I can just go ahead and be as late as you want. I'll read. I'll listen. I'll... Oh, there's... Another friend of mine <laughs> sending me missiological quotes from Samuel Zwamer. Um, so I'm just sitting there, and it's like, no worries, man. As long as I got some coffee and a phone, take the day off. Leave me there. I, I can sit for a long time. I'm just sitting there. Every day, there's the hostess. There, there's the host, Muhammad, and the hostess, and I don't remember her name. And every day, greetings, sir. Greetings. I'd go sit down eat my breakfast by myself. Now, there's other people from other countries there because it was an international hotel. So there was, you know, there was people from Asia. There was, you know, the UK. There was me. So I'm just there by myself every day. Out of the blue, one day, the hostess walks up to me, and I'm just sitting there drinking my coffee. And you got to remember, this is a 98% Muslim country. She walks up to me, and she says, Sir, are you going to church today? Mm, yeah. My father died two months ago. My brother's a drug addict, and my mother is brokenhearted, and we are having a very hard time. I said, write your name down, and I will pray for you. And I saw her for the next few days and encouraged her. But she came out of the blue. I didn't have a sign. There was a talk to me. I'm available. My ride's late. I got a few minutes. <laughs> just out of the blue. I look, you know, we, just a bunch of people in this hotel. Probably 80 people in the, hotel, in, the, in, the, in the breakfast place. She comes up. She just talks. I got to minister to her. Man. All right. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff here, kids. Matthew 14, verse 13. This is, this is one of the few stories that's in all four Gospels. This is, you ever notice how when you're reading the Word that there are some scriptures and stories that get your attention, and then there's some that grab your attention and don't let you go? Okay, this is a story that has gripped me for about three years and won't let me go. Preached in all the countries I go to, for some reason it doesn't leave me alone. Because I believe it's part of our discipleship training. This story. Jesus heard what had happened. What happened? John the Baptist got beheaded. Okay, that's a traumatic event. 
Jesus withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Jesus saw them. The word saw there is, is a little more than a glance. It's, it's where we get the word theater. He saw them in such a highlighted, dramatic visual that he had to do something. And he was moved with compassion, and he healed them of all kinds of diseases. Uh, amazing. You know, once again, you just kind of coattailed this with Matthew 10. When he calls the disciples, you, you know the story. He called his 12 to him. He gave them power. Who's our relationship with? Jesus. Who gives the power? Jesus. Over what? Unclean spirits. To do what? Cast them out. To heal all sickness. All kinds of disease. As you go, the assumption is we're going. As you go, preach. Proclaim. Talk. Share. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. What's the kingdom of heaven? The rule and reign of God in effect. What God wants done, gets done. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Nothing that you have, nothing that I have is my own. It's all his. I'm to freely give away what he has freely given me. Inventory sometime. Here's your homework. Write a list. Keep it to about 250 of all the good things that God has given you, and then freely give. That's life, man. I'm telling you what. There, to me, there's no other life than receiving from God and giving freely what God's given me. I don't think there's a better life out there. If there is, send me an email. Brandon at rockofroseville.com. <laughs> See, here's the deal. When you understand kingdom life, you realize sickness and disease does not have the last word. Addictions don't have the last word. Mental illness does not have the last word. Hopelessness does not have the last word. Jesus has the last word. Despair, famine, unrest, civil garbage going on. Doesn't have the last. Now, there may be victories and skirmishes perceived now. They don't have the last word. The 257 Christians that lost their life in Sri Lanka and the several churches that were bombed, they don't have the last word. Jesus has the last word. And you know what? I'm just going to tell you. I'm, I'll just speak this out right now. All the despair and hopelessness will give birth to a new, profound confidence and boldness in Christ to proclaim the gospel. And I believe you'll see revival as a result of that. What the enemy meant for evil, I believe God is going to turn around for good. And once again... <clears throat> I just want you to be aware of what goes on around the world. In the last couple of weeks, 70 to 100 um, Nigerians were killed, slaughtered, Christians. And a lot of them doesn't make the news because it doesn't fit into the political correct thing and theme that's going on out there. If you want to get rocked, download the app Open Doors. Keep you very aware of what persecution of the Christian looks like around the world. You would be shocked. And it's not getting less. It's getting more. So, we may be cozy for a season, no threat for a season. I don't think we're going to go the rest of our life without seeing some intensity. So, if I were you, I would grasp this message firmly. Kingdom life. Because in kingdom life, there is suffering. There's death. There's martyrdom. There's heartache and there's hardship. And there's suffering. Jesus, the apostles, and the rest of the followers throughout history have all experienced that. If by chance we don't, it's an anomaly. It's not the norm. It doesn't have the final word. It's three little tests to love people. I mean, here's what we've got to ask ourselves. Will I be generous to all, with all, that God has freely given me. The generosity of God is the cure for every malady on the planet. So what I'm going to have to ask, and I do ask myself, is how generous will I be? 
with my time, my money, where I go, will I go to inconvenient places? Will I go to hard places? Will I go to risky places? I got, this is the stuff that I keep asking myself. Remember, I want the gift bag and the seminar and the lanyard. I really do. But there's a compelling that goes on with discipleship, that it pulls you away from those things. And there's no getting around it. Once again, I'm looking for loopholes. There is no loopholes. Verse 15, Matthew 14, as evening approached, his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. I've been to this place. You know what was there then? Nothing. You know what's there now? Nothing. Seriously, it is just this out in the middle of nowhere place. It's desolate. It's desert is. It looks like Lincoln midsummer. <laughs> burnt grass. Every, I mean, just burnt. Rocky, dead. But you know what? Guess who's there? Jesus. Jesus is there. Where's he at? The deserted places. The desert places. The wilderness places. Some of us, like, we go into a wilderness, and if you haven't, you will. First inclination is, get me the way out of here. If you know that he's there, why don't you hang out for a while? Some of the best discipleship lessons are learned in the middle of nowhere. No props, no books, no people, just a whole bunch of lack and parch, parch. And that's where Jesus is. That's the, this is his training school. This is an awesome, awesome developmental season for the disciples. It's desert. What do the disciples do? They send the crowds away. That's what we do. Just go away. <laughs> Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves food. Test two. What do you see when you're looking at nothing? They're looking at nothing, man. They're looking at thousands of hungry people out in the middle of nowhere. Logic says, send them go. It's late, man. Jesus has been teaching. They're desperate. Remember, these people, these you want to talk about needy people? These are people that they don't even let Jesus grieve over John getting beheaded. He's just trying to get away, man, to just shed a few tears. And they see him get on a boat. They go, there he is. And all these needy people follow him, which says a lot about the character of Jesus. And it also, it also speaks a little about the insufficiency of boundaries. I think, I think it's funny. Jesus set a boundary. I'm grieving. I'm going to go somewhere else. <laughs> Thousands of people. No, you're not. <laughs> and they head him off at the pass. You know what Jesus could have said? I have my boundaries. And I'm for boundaries, by the way. Sometimes they don't work. <laughs> they just don't. For whatever reason, they don't work. Doesn't mean you don't set them. Doesn't mean you don't try to enforce them. But sometimes there are boundary busters out there. And Jesus gets busted here. His boundaries are busted. So what is he going to do? Get a bad attitude? Oh my God, I can't even get any time to myself. Nope. Why? Because kingdom compassion rules his life. Jeez. Send him away. What do you see when you're looking at nothing? What do you see when you look at broken people? Displaced people, marginalized people, trafficked people. Do you see brokenness or people that are blessable? Jesus sees all broken people as blessable. We sometimes go, I don't, I don't really have time for this. I just don't have time for this. I don't have the money for this. My schedule's already packed. Blessable. I ask myself, is the love of God in me greater than my excuses? And I got them too. I just want you to know. If not, why not? Because if the Bible is true, when it says if one part suffers, then all parts suffer with it. That means I'm connected on some level to the brokenness of my brothers and sisters everywhere. And I have some responsibility. Don't know what it is, but I have some. I think there's a couple picks there. Maybe. Yeah, man. I mean, 
This is a church that doesn't have a building, that meets on a dirt lot, that on the other side of that brick building is a lake of sewage. And it stinks, and they love God, and they worship God. And I don't know why, but did a meeting in here, and they're throwing rose petals at me, which I think is a good thing. It was kind of cute. Guy had to take a picture. Look at this. So in the midst of all this oppression and poverty, you, that's that, look at that heart rate there. That's incredible. People loving God, and they got nothing. They, no. You know what they got? Poverty and oppression. That's what they got, and they love God because they know the kingdom's not temporal. It's eternal. And you know what? And if they have to wait, they'll wait. What does God want done? I don't know. Probably a community center. What do you do with these guys? They're just looking at you. They're not at, they didn't ask for nothing. They're just looking at you. Somehow, the eyes of Jesus are behind those eyes. Looking at me, asking me, what are you going to do? I don't know. Going to do something, though. These guys waited hours hours out there as we were going from one meeting to another, just worshiping, man. That's your brothers and sisters. That's my brothers and sisters. Let's stand up. You see, you know, the, the disciples, you know, they start making all these excuses. There's too many people, not enough food, send them away, logic, logic, Logic. What I see in Scripture is that logic is not the language of the kingdom. Faith is. So anytime I kick into that, I got to figure this out, I let that confront me. I don't have to figure it out because God already has it figured out. And I have the mind of Christ. Is all I have to do is kind of, hey, ADD boy, dial in a little bit. <laughs> Dial in. What's the mind of Christ? Bow your head. Close your eyes. I need to ask you a really straight-up question. I mean, there's, I think I told you at the beginning, you know, there's people, different countries praying for us right now. And I really, 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 really felt when I was going through that little list of, you know, things that don't have the last word. Um, I, I think there's, there's two things that, like, really jumped out at me. One of them is mental illness. Now, <clears throat> yes, is there mental illness? Absolutely. What I'm after is somebody said that, you agreed with it, you attached to it, and you own that. And I'm here to kind of break that up. I'm not here to tell you don't stop going to counseling, stop taking your medication. I'm not telling you that at all. I'm just here to like break that thing, break that agreement. And then the other thing is that spirit of fear. I'm not talking about you have a little phobia, a little. I'm talking about this thing kind of runs around in you a lot. It's dominant. That's the word. Fear is dominant. Faith, hope, and love is not dominant. Fear is dominant. So either of those two things, would you raise your hand right now? We're going to pray, man. This, we're just going to do some kingdom work right now. Raise your hand if you relate to those two things, and we're going to pray. And I want people, if you wouldn't mind getting around these people that have their hands up, and we're going to pray. Keep your hand up. This is family, man. Nobody judge nobody in here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Father, I pray your kingdom would come. And your will would be done in the life of every person that had the humility and the courage to raise their hand. And Father, as their brothers and sisters, we do for them what they can't do for themselves. We break the attachments and the agreements and the consent that they gave to those things in the name of Jesus. And we ask you to loose them completely right now, God. We thank you that every person in this room has power, love, and a sound mind. 
We thank you that every person that we're praying for right now has the peace of God in them and on them that passes all understanding and will guard their hearts in the future. We come against fear, God. Fear of relationships not working out. Fear of the job not working out. Fear of the business not working out. Fear of our walk with Christ not working out, that we're going to blow it somehow. We're going to sabotage the deal. God, we break that fear in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I pray my brothers and sisters would receive the hope that's in God, the compassion and mercy of God, the confidence and boldness that's in Christ Jesus. Because as he is, so are we in this world right now. Father, I pray your kingdom come and your will would be done in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. and everybody said, Amen. and everybody shouted, Amen. Amen, so be it.